帝国となりましたのでこれよりカーボントラストと日本海事協会によるトランジションプランネットゼロに向けての移行計画と題しましたウェビナーを開催させていただきます今回このウェビナーの司会をさせていただきます日本海事協会認証部岩渕と申します本日のウェビナーには事前に200名を超える方のご登録を確認しており誠にありがとうございますでは早速ですがはじめに形式的に本日の注意事項を読み上げさせていただきますまず主張に関して本日オリジナル言語と日本語のみですので画面下に表示されています丸い形をしたマークをクリックいただきましてオリジナル言語と日本語のいずれかの選択をお願いいたしますなお、Zoom アプリが最新でない場合は、言語の選択ができませんので、ご注意ください。Wi-Fi 環境など、高速通信が可能な電波のいいところでのご視聴をお願いします。セキュリティソフトウェア等の機能により、配信システムがうまく機能しない場合がございます。あらかじめご了承ください。本公演の映像、音声等の録画、録音、ダウンロード、およびスクリーンショットの取得はご遠慮くださいまた本日のウェビナー仕様につきましては1時間前の開催リマインドメールよりご確認くださいでは早速ですが本日のウェビナーの開会のご挨拶をさせていただきます平田部長よろしくお願いします日本開示協会の平田でございます皆様、本日はお忙しい中、私どものウェビナーにご参加いただきまして、誠にありがとうございます。2020年より、英国カーボントラストとの共催でシリーズ開催している環境関連のウェビナーですが、今回で第7回目を迎えることとなりました。これまでのウェビナーでは、TCFD、SBT などを通じて、ネットゼロ達成に向けた企業や金融機関の役割に焦点を当ててまいりました。本日のウェビナーではトランジションプランネットゼロへの移行計画ということをテーマにして気候リスクの認識と移行計画の枠組み策定に焦点を当てています。内容としては一つ目として気候変動に関わるリスクと機会の評価のベストプラクティス二つ目としてレジリエンスの構築とコスト削減を目的としたリスクと機会の特定。三つ目としまして、ネットゼロに向けた実装計画。この三つについて、欧州の事例を交えながら解説いたします。本日のウェビナーが皆様にとりまして、気候変動とネットゼロ達成に向けた戦略の理解を深める一助となり、そして皆様のビジネスにとって有益な情報を提供できるものであることを心より願っております。簡単ではございますが、改めてご参加いただいている皆様に感謝申し上げ、開会の挨拶とさせていただきます。それではよろしくお願いいたします。平田部長、ありがとうございました。続きまして、山口様より環境情報開示における移行計画についてご説明いただきます。山口様、よろしくお願いします。皆様、こんにちは。県水コーポレーションの山口です。本日のウェビナーのテーマは移行計画、トランジションプランです。これは気候変動の世界でこれから2050年に向けてネットゼロ社会への移行を成し遂げるのに目標だけでなく実際どのような実装計画、資金計画を有しているかについて各企業が投資家、金融機関に示していくことを意味しています。本日のメインスピーカーはカーボンストラストでネットゼロの分野の責任者であるマネージングディレクターのヒュージョーンズとアカデミアの接点で質の高い仕事を続けているディレクターのアレン・スミス・グリスピーの2人です。移行計画の作り方について幅広く講演いただきます。そしてその前に私の方から、えー、環境情報開示から見た移行計画について少しお時間をいただきたいと思います。よろしくお願いいたします。こちらはウェブナーごとにお見せしている環境情報開示を取り巻くグローバルなイニシアティブの流れです。新しい事象は下に書き加えてきているのですが、今回書き足しました事象の一つが TPT です。この10月に英国で公表されました TPT は、トランジションプランニングタスクフォースの略です。これはマッカーニー氏の主導で2年前の COP26 で結成された GARFANS。
で、えーまあ、投資家からの要請をまとめたネットゼロ、えー、トランジションプランニングの流れを受けて設定されています。話は少しそれますけれども日本海事協会から、えー、この機会をいただいて、えー、2020年から続けている、えー、共済ウェビナーですが今回で7回目となります。まあ、振り返るとこの表にある事象について環境情報開示を広めたいという思いから、まあ、テーマを設定してウェビナーを開催してまいりました第3回は2022年の3月に実施しておりますがその時のテーマがネットゼロ達成に向けてのトランジションですグラスゴーでの先ほど申し上げた COP26 の後を受けて G ファンズからの要請でえー、後ほどお話しする、えー、TCFD のガイダンスに基づいた変化が公表された直後に、えー、その変化についてウェビナーを開催しています。今回はあれから1年半経ちまして、えー、CDPTCFD そして ISSB とつながる環境情報開示の流れが、まあ、しっかりと見えてきておりまして、えー、移行計画があの情報開示でもその必要性と、えー、存在感をしっかりと示してきております。そしてこの10月に公表された TPP でその流れが定着してきていることをぜひ皆様にお伝えしたいできればというふうに思っておりますそれではまず環境情報開示の流れを改めて見てみたいと思いますこちらは CDP、TCFD、ISSB の流れを年代順に先ほどの年表からピックアップして並べてみました CDP は投資家からの要請に基づき2003年から企業からの気候変動の情報開示を集めることをスタートしました国家予算のに匹敵するような売り上げや大きな収益を上げているコングロマリットをはじめ巨大化した世界経済の構成要素である企業からの開示を促し個々の企業の意識をよりサステナブルに変えていかなければ地球の将来はないという観点でそれまでは国単位の発想が強かった中で環境情報開示を企業単位に変えて開示を要請してまいりましたそれによって企業のサステナブルなブランドサステイナブルなマーケティングの意識を高めていただいたと思いますそして2015年のパリ合意で二度 C 目標が掲げられ SBT も誕生し開示そしてそれにプラス目標設定が定着しますそして2017年の TCFD の提言では排出量の話を経済的インパクトという観点で金融の立場で環境情報開示を意識するようになりますそれと並行して IPCC の 1.5 年特別レポートからネットゼロの目標が掲げられ、まあ、企業は投資家からの要請に基づきネットゼロを目指して TCFD 対応を進めてまいりますそれまでまた乱立していたサスティビリティ開示のイニシアティブが2021年から IFAS のもと IFAS 財団のもと、まあ、ISSB で統一され財務情報と環境情報が一体化する流れが確立されてきたと言えましょうさて引き続きまた CDP の話で恐縮ですがこちらは CDP の回答企業数の推移です。2023年の回答者数今年の10月に発表されましたばかりですけれども。昨年の1800あ1万8600社から4000社以上増えて2万3000社超の回答を受けておりますこの中にこの中には世界の株式総額の 66% 超を占める時価総額67兆ドルに達する上場企業も含んでおりますこの2万3000社のうち投資家要請からの回答企業数が約5800社大手購買企業顧客企業からの要請が要請で回答をいただいているいわゆるサプライチェーンの回答が約2万社でございますこの10月から新 CEO に就任したシェリー・マデーラの段を載せましたけれども今後 CDP は一層 ISSB との統合を進めることから TNFD などのネイチャーを取り込むことそして企業からの会場をより受けやすくするいうことを強調しておりますシェリーはデータに強いバックグラウンドがあり今後は一層データの標準化や投資家企業公的機関とのデータの共有化に向けた取り組みも一層進むと思います次に TCFD について
CDP との接点という観点でおさらいをしたいと思います。DCFD の設立の背景は気候変動によって飛躍的に増大した自然災害の保険金支払いが金融システムの不安定要素となってきたことを危惧して G20 が企業と金融機関に物理リスク賠償責任リスクそして移行リスクを開示することを提言したことが発端です。当時イングランド銀行総裁でファズムの議長でしたマッカーニー氏が提唱いたしました。えー、右上に水色の文字で入れましたのが、えー、保険金の数字ですけれどもインパクトですが毎年の自然災害による経済的損失は2017年の前の5年間の平均が520億ドルと言われておりますがそれに対して2017年からの5年間の平均は、えー、毎年その2倍以上の1100億ドルになっていると言われています。また昨年の22年の自然災害による経済的損失は 2,840 億ドルとまたそのうち 1,250 億ドルは保険でカバーされたとこれが TCFD のステータスレポートで伝わってきています。TCFD 提言の質問構成はガバナンス戦略リスク管理指標と目標で CDP のそれと同じような形ですが TCFD に取り入れられたここにある左側にあります、えー、新たな7要素財務的影響の評価とかあシナリオ分析長期目標の設定バリューチェーン全体のエンゲージメントなどの7項目に関しては、えー、CDP は2017年から19年の間にしっかりと取り入れ TCF 対応の整合性を確立しております、えー、このプロセスに関しては、まあ、当時私 CDP の職員として家事協会のセミナーでもご説明する機会をいただきましたしその内容は東京財団の CSR 白書に,、えー、にも書かせていただいたので、まあ、個人的にもよく記憶しております、まあ、今となってはここにある7点は CDP にとって当たり前の質問項目ですがこれは TCFD 対応で取り入れられた内容です、えー、最も大きな変更はそれまでの CDP の質問書はいわゆる排出量のトンベースのお話が中心でしたがドルベースの財務,インパク財務インパクトも記載するようになったということだと思います。でこちらがその TCFD 提言の11の質問項目に対する CDP の気候変動質問書の質問番号です。CDP は2017年から始まった TCFD に対応で CDP に回答していれば TCFD 提言対応ができていると。いう体制を確立しておりますさて、えー、次は ISSB の設立についてですそれまでいくつか分かれていた国際的なサ,サステナビリティ開示を統一する目的で2021年のグラスゴーで COP26 において、えー、IFAS 財団から ISSB の立ち上げが発表ありました、えー、ここにある IIRC と、えー、SASB が VRF にまとまっていたわけですがそれが CDSB と一体になるということが発表されたわけです。CDSB は CDP からのスタッフも多くいてこの環境情報開示の統合は CDP にとっては悲願の一つだったと思います。ISSB は COP26 の翌年22年の3月に草案が発表され23年の6月に最終案が発表されています。CDP の新 CEO からのコメントにもありましたが CDP は ISSB の流れを全面的にサポートし2024年の質問書から IFAS の S2 対応を取り入れていくことが表明されています、えー、次に TCFD と ISSB の関係を見てみます本年7月に TCFD 提言に関するモニタリング機能が2024年から ISSB に引き継がれることが発表されていますこれによって TCFD 提言の内容は ISSB に移管されることになります。実証でお話しいたしますが TCFD も2017年以来大きく発展してきております。財務情報として一体化の流れを作ってきたわけですけれどもまさに IFAS の作った ISSB に移管されることでその役目をある意味果たしてきたと言いましょう。このウェビナーでは第2回に TCFD のメンバーの一人であるマーク・ルイス氏にスコープ3の重要性について語っていただいたことがありますが
、この TCFD のボードもこれから ISSB に組み込まれていくということになります。いずれにしても TCFD は ISSB と一体化、TCF、でそして TCFD と一体化をすでに進ませている CDP も2024年から ISSB の S2 気候変動の部分の内容を取り込むことを表明しており環境情報開示の流れはデータとしての CDP そして財務情報との一体化としての ISSB という形にまとまってきたといえます。えー、それでは、えーその活動を ISSB に移管することが言われている TCFD ですけれども、まあ、これまでの歩みと2021年10月にガイダンスを発表していますがその内容について触れてみたいと思います。こちらのグラフは TCFD ステータスレポートの今年の分からですが TCFD 賛同企業組織は設立当初より順調に拡大してきて昨年は4855社というレポートとになっていますこれは CDP の投資家要請の2022年の規模と同じくらいです中小企業や未上場企業も巻き込んでいる CDP のサプライチェーンを含めた回答企業数に比してはその数は少ないですが世界の大手の企業インパクトの大きい企業についてしっかりと報告がされてきていることを表していますただ賛同企業がすべて TCFD に回答しているわけではないのでその回答状況について次に見てみたいと思いますこちらは TCFD の11項目のそれぞれの回答状況を2020年、21年、22年の3年間プロットしたものです賛同企業数も拡大し回答率も上昇しております常に指標と目標の項目では6、7割の企業、組織が回答してきておりますまあ、今年はさらに賛同企業数回答率とも上昇が見込まれております。えー、そして、えー、TCFD の21年10月のガイダンスですが、えー、TCFD は指標と目標と移行計画に関するガイダンスを公表しています。移行計画という概念がまあここで登場し、今までの提言にあった指標と目標を中心に移行計画に沿ったより具体的表示方法を提示しています具体的移行関連の開示項目がここにある7つでございますまあ、もともと移行リスク物理的リスクの概念にあったあという概念は持っていた TCFD ですがあまあ、機械も含めてそれをより明確に記述することが要求されてきていますそして資本形成についてつまり、えー、財務の測的リスクに対する財務的備えの開示が求められていると。また、インターナルカーボンプライシングとか、マネジメントの気候関連に対する報酬体系についても開示が求められていると。余談ですが、昨今の先進企業から発行されている TCFD 報告を見ていると、かなりこの新たな定義に即したリスクおよび機会の開示はなされてきていると思います。一方で資本形成、財務計画からカーボンプライシング、このあたりは企業の一層の取り組みを期待したいというところかと思います。移行計画が生まれた背景は、最初に申し上げました、金融機関が投資家、金融機関や投資家が投資判断にあたり、目標達成までにどのように企業が進んでいくのか、企業が事業を継続しながら、しっかりとネットゼロ目標を進めるのかについて財務的裏付けも含めて道筋を開示することを求めてきたからという背景があります。企業はもはや脱炭素化に向けた目標を公表することや取り組みや状況を開示するだけでは不十分で現状から目標までの具体的な計画実装計画財務計画を示すことが求められてきていると言えましょう。さてここからは TCFD と歩調を合わせて2021年から気候計画関連の質問を整えてきた CDP の移行計画関連の質問への回答状況を見ていきたいと思いますこちらが細かいですけれども2022年の移行計画関連の CDP の気候変動質問項目ですガバナンス財務計画バリューチェーンのエンゲージメント戦略リスクと機会
指標と目標と、まあ、TCFD, TCFD とほぼ同じカテゴリーとなっていますけれども、まあ、ポリシーエンゲージメントなどがあるのが CDP の特徴かもしれません。個別の質問の中には、まあ、移行計画という言葉がしっかりと組み込まれています。また C の 2.3 と 2.4 は、まあ、AB のどちらかに答えることになりますが、まあ、質問はすべて、えー、質問の数はすべてでは21問ということになりますで各カテゴリーの回答状況ですワイン色の棒グラフの方が2022年の全体の回答数である1万8600社のうちそのカテゴリーに答えた会社のパーセンテージですでグレーの方が 1.5 度 C に合致する気候変動を移行計画を策定しているということを報告している4100社のうちそのカテゴリーへの回答率を示しています。まあ、いわばグレーの方がより先進的な企業がの4100社のうちのパーセンテージということになります。リスクと機会について触れている企業の割合はかなり増えてきていますが、まあ、財務官計画やネットゼロ目標を明確に持っているところはまだ少ないというふうに言えます。えー、っと、ちょっと、まあ、そのレポートの内容を続けますけれども、二十二年の O. C. D. P. 回答企業の一万八千六百社のうち。ええー、まあ、四千百社は先ほど申し上げたような、ああ、一点五度シーンそった移行計画に基づいて回答しておりますが。ええー、二十一問のすべてに回答した、ああ、企業は、ああ、実はたったの四十一社で。0.4% でございますで、えー、それではまあそのそれぞれの回答状況についてカテゴリー別に見てみたいと思いますけどまずそのリスクと機会について全回答数の 32% がリスクと機会について回答しています。でグループ2いわゆる 4,100 社のうち先進的な 4,100 社のうちは 50% 以上がリスクと機会については回答しています。ガバナンスについても3分の1以上がガバナンスについて回答していますしグループ2では 55% 以上と、まあ、なかなかしっかりした回答率になってきていると思います。それから全,全回答企業の4分の1以上が経営陣の気候変動問題に連携した報酬体系を採用しているというふうに報告しています。ポリシーエンゲージメントは、えー、と全体の 19% ということで、まあ、それほど高くはないですけれども、まあ、一定の評価があると思います。シナリオ分析については、えー、全企業のうち 3,315 社 18% からシナリオ分析について、えー、グループ2では、えー、そのうちの 48% 以上がシナリオ分析回答しております。まあ、TCFD の提唱が始まった時にはですねまあ、これは新しい項目でしたので、えー、馴染みの大きかったシナリオ分析ですが、まあ、確実に回答項目として浸透してきているということが言えると思います。そして、えー、とスコープ123のいわゆる、えー、指標の方それとそれの第三者検証についてですけれども、えー、全体の回答うち、まあ、スコープ1について回答しているのは 71% スコープ2はもうほとんど 100% に近い 99%。スコープ3はまだ 22% そして第三者検証は 14% と、まあ、こういう全体からの回答率です。えー、特にまあスコープ3のと第三者検証についてはまだこれから拡大が必要であると思いますけれども、まあ、グループ2においては 43% がですね第三者検証を実施していますので、えー、まあそれなりのこちらも数字になってきていると思います。えー、バリューチェーンエンゲージメントと低炭素イニシアティブ、まあ、この項目についてはまだ、えー、としっかりとした数字が出ており、えー、ではなく、まあ、16% が、まあ、サプライチェーンエンゲージメントに関する、えー、詳細を開示していますとそれから炭、えー、低炭素製品やサービスに関する十分な詳細を開示している企業はまだわずか 11% サプライチェーンと低炭素製品サービスの両方の詳細を開示している企業はまだわずか 8% という数字でございます。次に目標になりますが、まあ、前回答のうち、えー、いわゆる長期の目標 SBT もしくは SBT に準じた目標を持っているところは 
672社で 3.6% という数字になっていますまだまだ少ない数字で、まあ、SBT キャンペーンとかを CDP 展開しておりますけれどもそういったことで SBT の拡大が必要かと思われます財務計画についてこちらの数字もですね全回答のうち十分な回答ができているのは 3% 程度で、まあ、こちらもまだまだ改善の余地がある項目だと思います以上が各カテゴリーについてのコメントですこうしてみますとまだまだ回答率の観点では改善が必要なのは明らかですけれども2022年の結果を分析したレポートでは結論として以下の点を挙げていますで目としては回答の中で 30% 以上の企業が次の2年間で 1.5 度 C に合致する移行計画を策定する意向を明確に示していますとまた RTPT のような規制の動きもあり移行計画の開示欲は確実に拡大していることが言われていますそれから CDP は移行計画を不可欠な要素であると認識し2021年から25年の5年計画の中で中心的な位置づけを持っていますで、開示内容もその単なる開示から行動計画を策定してその方向性をしっかりと表していくそういった方向をサポートしているというところがありますで、まあ、3つ目は状況ですけれども、まあ、2000 23年の移行計画関連の回答はあの回答分析は、まあ、これから進められて、まあ、今年のレポートは2月に出ていますので、まあ、来年の2月ぐらいにはこの2万 3,000 社に向けて、えー、レポートが出てくると思います。で TPT も始まり投資家や規制当局のです、ね、対応も進んでです、ねまあ、企業組織の移行関連説明,説明へのです、ね、回答意欲は確実に高まっていることが見えますので、今年の分析内容は大きな前進が予想されるとこういうふうに見ております。えー、以上で私の方からのご説明を終わりしたいと思います。えー、引き続き、えー、ヒューとアレンからの移行計画についての内容をぜひ、えー、見てください。よろしくお願いいたします。どうもありがとうございました。山口様ありがとうございましたそれではここでカーボントラストヒューさんとアレンさんよりご講演いただきたいと思いますヒューさんアレンさんよろしくお願いいたします Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to our presentation Transition Planning Developing Your Route to Net Zero My name is Hugh Jones from the Carbon Trust and with my colleague Alan Smith Gillespie we are going to Present this to you over the next 30 to 40 minutes. Today, we're going to be giving some context for who we are and for why action is necessary. We're going to be talking about quantifying the risks and opportunities presented by climate change. And then, Alain will talk in detail about transition planning itself. So, the Carbon Trust is now 22 years old. We have well over 400 experts globally, and we are united by one simple but difficult mission, which is to accelerate the move to a decarbonized future. And every piece of work, every project that we engage in serves that mission. As you can see, we have a number of Locations now around the world, of which two are in Asia, but also we support our work strongly through a, a central team of、uh, highly qualified experts working quite, quite often、uh, remotely and virtually to support the on the ground work that we do with our clients. And we've set out here a view of the propositions that we Support and take to our clients to to help with the net zero journey. You can see there are four columns there. We provide insights into what is it that our clients are going to need to do, what are the risks and opportunities, and we help them to become even more ambitious where we can 
in the fight against climate change. Then we help them strategize how they're going to do it. It's not enough just to look at an organization's own decarbonization. We have to look at the entire value chain, but it's increasingly also not enough just to look at current operations. We need to look at future changes to the business model because in many, many cases, business will have to be done differently. And we always look at the full systems approach to avoid any unintended consequences. So to give a simple example, if uh, biofuels are produced through growing bio crops, does that displace food production and would that be a bad outcome? So we look not just at narrow decarbonization, but at the broader consequences of, of, of actions. Thirdly, the transition itself. So this really refers to the medium and longer term changes which are going to be required after the next few years when industry, society and the structures that support us are very probably going to look quite different. So that requires imagination and planning. It requires detailed feasibility studies of what is possible. And it will require significant finance. And in many cases, it will require partnering with sector companies, even with competitors, in many cases with supply chain partners, with financial institutions and other institutions. So we, we help organizations look at all of that. And then throughout this, it's really important to understand and quantify the impact of the work that companies are doing, whether that's to disclose and perhaps get some endorsement and credit for what companies are doing. So our product label for carbon reduction is an example of that. Or it might be for getting a level of assurance over future targets uh, and of, of future activities, for example, to, to arrange maybe financing at preferential rates, uh, depending on the, the kind of the attitude of the finance provider. Uh, so measuring impact and assuring impact is increasingly important in lots of different contexts. And here are the logos of just a few of the companies that we work with. A lot of these are European companies, not all of them, um, but it's notable that many of them are global and hopefully you will recognize quite a few of these in, in Japan. The important point on the clients that we work with is that they cover every possible industry sector and that's because it's really important to have sustainable leadership in all sectors and of course supply chains. So now we're going to talk about the imperative for action. As you will have seen over the past year, there are increasingly frequent extreme weather events. These can be linked by scientists to climate change and, and are already impacting countries and economies across the world. There have been droughts and wildfires across the globe this year, for example. And additionally, in the face of this, countries are working to implement policies to limit warming, such as the carbon border adjustment mechanism recently launched by the European Union. And this too is in itself having effects on global economies. So there are both physical and what we call transition effects of climate change that are being felt even today across organizations. There's also still a lot of uncertainty around the future development of both of these areas because of the climate change that we will be causing to happen. Now, following 
COP27 last year, it was calculated that the current policies and actions that have been put in place have set us on a pathway to a global average temperature rise of around 2.7 degrees. Not a huge number, but highly significant, even when compared to one and a half degrees, which is, of course, the target from the whole COP process. As new policies and actions are introduced, as you can see from this graph, there remains high level of uncertainty around the speed and the severity that these changes will cause, the effect that they will have on the operations of organizations. And now just to take a quick step to look at Science-Based Target Initiative, which many of you will be familiar with. This was set up at the time of the Paris COP in 2015, when the original science-based targets were first set out. And it's been very successful. Uh, there are now well over 3,500 organizations with science-based targets. And in fact, well over 6,000 organizations who have committed to some form of climate action within this initiative. But the key point on science-based targets and on net zero is that it, it isn't so much around the end target itself, it's around the trajectory. So if, for example, you set a short and long-term science-based target to be net zero by, say, 2050, it really matters how quickly you get there because the more decarbonization you can achieve in the early years means there is less CO2 up there in the atmosphere and less damage is done. So you can't just run along until 2040 and do it all in the last 10 years. You have to be doing it year on year, as this graph suggests. And then once you get to the target year, the residual emissions, so for example, industrial processes, heavy goods, transport, things that are impossible to, to actually totally remove, those have to be neutralized by what we call greenhouse gas removals to sequester actual CO2 year on year from the target year. So climate risks, because these are different to traditional risks, they are more difficult to manage. They, are, they tend to be systemic, in, insofar as they affect all of society across various sectors and geographies. As you will have seen from previous slides, climate change risks and opportunities are certainly not always linear. Past trends are not necessarily a strong predictor of future outcomes. And while we're not certain about what this will look like, we do know that climate change is happening and significant changes will materialize in the way that we have to operate. And finally, as warned by the IPCC, once we get beyond certain thresholds, damage will be irrevocable. And in that respect, the impacts will be both permanent and self-perpetuating. So here are some example climate risks and opportunities. Climate change risks can broadly be split into transition risks, which relate to policies and actions which in themselves are set there to limit emissions. So these would include risks like carbon pricing mechanisms, development and use of new technologies, shifts in supply and demand for commodities, changing consumer preferences, which also, of course, uh, have an effect on demand. And then there are physical risks, 
which relate to the impact of acute weather events such as floods or cyclones, but also chronic physical risks such as longer term shifts in climate patterns such as water stress. But it should be noted that the transition to a low carbon future should also provide opportunities for improving resource efficiency, for harnessing low emission energy sources, for innovation and the development of new low emission products or services, which will help access new markets, build resilience and ensure business relevance in a net zero world. And these categories are all defined within the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures framework, which has formed the basis for upcoming reporting standards. Now, the TCFD, as it's known, was originally created through the, the G20, actually, back in 2017. And as you can see there, it sets out a categorization of risks and opportunities. It's very, been a very effective framework and it's seen still as the best practice for disclosing climate related risk and opportunities. The framework is made up of the risks and opportunities categories that we just outlined in the previous slide. And the design of it is intended to integrate climate risk management practices across an organization and to help the organization consider their impact on strategic planning and financial statements. So a good way to think about this is that whereas historically organizations published reports of their impact on the environment and how they were reducing their adverse impacts through good behavior, good activities. This is actually about the impact of climate change of the environment on an organization. And because it's set out as financial reporting, it's by definition a board level issue. And this has really helped to elevate the importance of climate change within corporations, which you know, to some extent, before the advent of TCFD had placed a lot of this work in their corporate responsibility or sustainability team. And it arguably wasn't always getting the board level attention regularly that it needs to be getting. And incoming reporting standards harness the TCFD framework as the foundation for reporting climate risk and opportunities. So this is really important to, to, to bear in mind going forward. And we're going to see a, a good level of um, consolidation of some of these uh, reporting standards in the coming months. And as you can see on this slide, the two of the key areas for disclosure frameworks in addition to the TPT are the, the ISSB, which is a standard for um, non-financial information disclosures. And we are seeing that that will fully adopt the TCFD framework. And then specifically for the EU, so not directly relevant in all countries, but clearly an important factor and multinational organizations will have to bear this in mind is the the mandatory uh, CSRD um, disclosure legislation, which is happening, being rolled out in European organizations over the next couple of years. So how do we assess climate related risks and opportunities? Well, 
we believe it's really important to look beyond the obvious hotspots to proactively explore risks and opportunities for value creation and resilience. So to do this, we recommend assessing the external risk drivers aligned to the TCFD categories relating to each risk and opportunity. We recommend undergoing a business mapping exercise to ensure that all vulnerabilities are uncovered and to use the latest industry standard scenario data pulling from, for example, the IPCC and NGFS data sources because we believe that climate change risk and opportunity analysis is vital to drive business resilience and business change and indeed cost reduction and it goes well beyond a compliance exercise in its in its use. So put it simply we are have an approach with four key steps. It's important to note that these have to be tailored to specific organizations needs. Firstly, the identification of risks and opportunities. So we engage stakeholders and information holders to fully understand their operations and their value chain and using knowledge of market developments, clients, climate science and policy with company specific characteristics, we help map the risk and opportunity landscape. So the output of this stage would be a long list of the risks and opportunities which are tailored to a specific organization with its business model. Then in phase two, we prioritize the risks and opportunities using a systematic approach to qualitatively identify the most material risks and opportunities for the organization. Then in as part of this prioritization, we select three scenarios. We would recommend a current policies business as usual scenario, a transition scenario aligning to, to a net zero trajectory, and a failure to act scenario with very little action and high levels of warming under which any physical risk would be at its most material, its highest. We then in encourage internal stakeholders to score qualitatively each risk and opportunity for expected velocity, i.e. speed of change, likelihood, i.e. frequency and probability, materiality, both financial and environmental. And together we combine these scores to then support the organization understanding which are their most material risks and which do they need to understand in more detail. And many companies who are already reporting against the TCFD framework have completed these steps and have a clear understanding of the risks and opportunities facing their organization. However, according to the latest TCFD status report and what we've seen from our clients, organizations who report against the TCFD framework are less advanced in the next two steps, three and four on here, which are required actually in Europe to align to CSRD reporting and are preferred for good practice everywhere. So step three, the in-depth financial modeling. This is done across the most material risks and opportunities as identified in the previous step. To complete this, we recommend really understanding your value drivers to determine where your capital is concentrated what are the sensitivities and dependencies of your business model? We then perform quantitative scenario analysis to understand how the risk will materialize across different scenarios, drawing on parameter data specific to each risk and opportunity. We calculate your gross value at stake across a range of climate scenarios and understand the financial impact of the risk or indeed the opportunity. And as a result of this step, we could highlight the cost of inaction, we can inform investment cases, and we can evidence the financial benefit of an ambitious climate strategy. And then step four 
is the risk response identification metrics and targets. We recommend defining a mitigation strategy for each risk and opportunity. And in addition to this, targets should be established to provide guidance and track progress over time. And then finally, at the bottom there, stage five, which is the reporting support. Uh, it's really important to translate analysis into clear and concise information that can be used for external disclosures and which can contribute to meeting the latest mandatory reporting standards. So that's really the core of what we do around risk analysis. To bring this to life, this here is an example snapshot from an output for a global dairy company that we worked with to identify their risks and opportunities. Steps one and two allowed the company to produce a comprehensive list of risks and opportunities per TCFD category and value chain stage by consolidating knowledge and experience across their organization along with the latest climate science. We then split the risks by risk category and value chain stage, enabling the organization to easily engage with its key internal stakeholders impacted by the risk or opportunity to assign responsibility for future risk management. And as you can see in this case, the organization will be impacted upstream by carbon prices, by regulation of plastics, by insurance costs, by water scarcity, where operation risks involve increased energy prices and direct carbon pricing. Additionally, you can see opportunities in green across the value chain, from route optimization to reduced transportation emissions, introducing dry factories to build resilience against water stress and low carbon alternative products. And the risks and opportunities here have undergone qualitative scenario analysis and a final impact score has been assigned for risks which you can see in the yellow to red. Three is predicted high impact and one is low impact. And for the opportunities, the dark green are more impactful than the light green. And then following this analysis, the top risks and opportunities were selected to be taken forward for further work. And here's another example, this time from a property management company who took forward the opportunity uh, for a shift of energy sources to low carbon alternatives. They took this forward for further analysis in step three after identifying it as a key opportunity in steps one and two. The opportunity is analyzed under the stress scenario for which a transition opportunity is one and a half degrees net zero aligned. A current policy scenario, business usual scenario as well, which only consider expected business growth. And here you can see the expected savings calculated using current prices, future prices under each scenario, the amount of energy procured and expected business growth. As the cost of high intensive fuels in the net zero 2050 scenario is far greater than currently expected under current policies, you can see that the impact of the opportunity is far higher, far greater in the stress scenario. And this analysis also provides insights into the time frame in which the opportunity will arise, whereas thresholds for short, medium and long term are aligned to existing rich risk management practices in this particular organization. So the results of this analysis provide the company with a comprehensive understanding of each climate change related risk and opportunity and the potential for cost reduction or the potential for new markets. And in this case, these key insights for our client were taken forward by their finance team to ensure that the impact of the balance book is captured and will be externally reported. And then finally, in this section, after understanding the gross financial impact of risks and opportunities in step four, these insights can be used to inform mitigation strategies and to set targets to measure progress along the way. 
starting from gross value at stake insights, initiatives can be defined to limit or harness the risk to opportunities such as reducing emissions and energy consumption, innovating product processes to adapting to market changes, increasing circularity of products to mitigate reputational risks, engaging third parties such as suppliers, uh, logistics partners, customers and governments to decarbonize, moving away from areas of risk early and cost effectively. And all of this together can help the organizations start to tie together sustainability initiatives across the whole breadth of its activity and to put them into a clear and actionable transition plan. So that's the risk and opportunity analysis. Now I'm going to hand over to Elen, who is going to talk about transition planning and action. Elen. Thank you, Hugh. I will now cover what companies should do to effectively plan their transition to net zero and address climate related risks and opportunities. As previously discussed, the climate transition needs to happen. It will either be forced on us, resulting in a disorderly transition and unmitigated negative impacts, or we can take a proactive approach to ensure an orderly transition where risks are effectively managed and we achieve net zero goals as rapidly as possible. The number of companies committing to science-based targets has grown significantly, and over the past years, regulatory and voluntary standards have required companies to assess and communicate their position on climate-related risks and opportunities. However, most companies have not developed or communicated how they will achieve science-based targets and plan their net zero transition, or to address the climate-related risks and opportunities, opportunities that they face. Transition plans that have been published by companies vary significantly in detail and quality. The Transition Plan Task Force, or TPT, was established to create a clear standard for what a transition plan should contain and published their final guidance in October this year. The TPT is designed to be consistent with and build on the final climate related disclosure standard issued by the International Sustainability Standards Board, or ISSB, of the Financial Reporting Standards or IFRS Foundation. This itself builds on the recommendations and guidance of the TCFD. The TPT published a best practice disclosure framework to guide companies in developing and communicating their transition plans to achieve net zero and address climate related risks and opportunities. This is organized across three principles, ambition, action and accountability with specific disclosure elements and sub-elements. These cover all aspects that a company should undertake to implement climate commitments and address risks and opportunities, from developing a strategic view of their future business model through to implementing decarbonization actions and reporting progress and performance. However, currently, a very small number of companies have credible transition plans, even when they may have committed to science-based targets and net zero. An FT article recently discussed a survey where only 5% of FTSE 100 companies had credible transition plans. Companies that have committed to ambitious targets and disclosed their climate-related risks and opportunities need to also communicate how these will be achieved. Without robust transition plans, companies will be at risk of being accused of greenwashing and will not have the ability to effectively execute their ambitions. In particular, Companies need to develop and communicate how they will implement these actions to achieve decarbonization commitments. It is important to note that the Transition Plan Task Force, or TPT Disclosure Framework, is not a process or a roadmap for developing a transition plan. I will therefore now focus on key elements that should be at the core of all transition plans and enable companies to adhere to the disclosure requirements of TPT or similar regulatory uh, requirements in, in the region in which they operate. In particular, this will include developing a net zero roadmap for how a company should transition their business model and value chain to rapidly decarbonize and address climate related risks and opportunities. At Carmen Trust, we support companies develop net zero roadmaps to underpin their transition plans and enable them to achieve climate ambitions, drive innovation, meet regulatory requirements and attract investment. The net zero roadmaps which we develop for companies include four key elements. The first 
is a clear understanding of the context in which a company needs to develop their net zero commitments and the rationale and business case for doing this. The second is development of an actual reduction strategy of greenhouse gas emissions. Thirdly, building all together the, the various commitments and actions that a company needs to uh, de develop and implement and gain buy-in across different stakeholders into what we call a North Star set of commitments. And finally, assessing and defining a key set of catalysts that will enable the roadmap to be implemented from KPIs through to governance requirements that a company needs to put, to pl put in place. In the first area around net zero context, a company should assess the business case for action and clearly translate that into key areas that are relevant to it. For example, what is the impact that uh, action or inaction will have on the brand of the company? To what extent is net zero a strategic opportunity for a company? How does the company need to comply with policy requirements and other regulations? And finally, what does a company need to consider in terms of uh, how it will be, uh, how it will compete with uh, other players in the markets in which it operates? So in particular, the positioning that this will give it, uh, also whether it takes or does not take action with regarding to net zero. The second area is developing a, a robust reduction strategy for a company. This, of course, starts with uh, the current set of emissions that a company has and looks at identifying a key set of actions that a company can undertake to reduce its emissions and to decarbonize through to a target year. Science-based targets define the trajectory that a company needs to take, but a company needs to also define how it will get there. The first aspect is to look at how a company's emissions will change over time if it does nothing, if it does nothing. Then from that position to look at ways in which uh, different aspects of its emissions, whether they're scope one and two emissions within its own operations or scope three emissions across its value chain can decarbonize over time. This will be impacted and influenced by a set of factors that the company may be able to control or those that it has no control over uh, or those that it can potentially influence. We are now, will now look at the key levers that a company can consider for reducing its scope one and two emissions, as well as its scope three emissions. As an overview, a company can consider a set of levers relating to scope one and two emissions that relate to uh, management and process improvements and changes within, within its company, and also looking at sourcing decisions around the energy that it procures and the technology that it uses within its own operations. With regards to its value chain or scope three emissions, there are a set of levers a company can implement which have an impact on upstream emissions or those that are embodied within the products and services that a company sells, or levers that have an impact downstream, for example, in the use phase of its products or at the end of life of, of those products. We'll now look at each of these specific levers uh, with regards to organizational scope one and two or value chain scope three in more detail. In scope one and two, the decarbonization levers that a company should assess and examine in terms of their potential <clears throat> include energy management, for example, implementing energy management systems and, um, and energy management and monitoring and targeting approaches and systems, improvements to operational efficiency and process efficiency, which includes process redesign, looking at logistics and transport, or the fleet that it may use if, if it has a fleet of vehicles as part of the business. And similarly, looking at how it sources and uses energy or influences that um, its processes and technology that it uses has on the energy on its energy consumption. With regards to energy sourcing, a company should look at how it procures and the potential that it has for procuring renewable energy, for example, through green energy uh, uh, procurement, uh, developing PPAs or power purchase agreements uh, with utility companies, and also looking at the energy consumption of the technology and 
the machinery, for example, that it may use, or the assets, also buildings, for example, that, co that a company may have in place. All these will have impact on energy consumption. So a company needs to look at the quality of its assets, uh, how it will procure these assets going forward, when it may need to replace them. Uh, and that includes, as mentioned, both uh, machinery, production processes, production uh, equipment, buildings, and also uh, if a company does have fleet or logistics, looking at how those can also be upgraded, for example, to electrify um, vehicles over time. One of the biggest area of emissions that a company typically has are scope three emissions. So it's very important to look at the various types of levers that a company can have at its disposal to decarbonize scope three emissions. Uh, we see these as falling across five key areas, and that includes product design, uh, the product or service portfolio or offering that a company provides to its customers, the design of its business model, supply chain key decarbonization and uh, sourcing decisions that a company takes. And all those can have an impact on upstream emissions uh, or downstream scope three emissions. So for example, with regards to product design, a company can look at uh, substituting the materials uh, that the pro its products are made of, for example, from high carbon to lower carbon uh, uh, materials, looking at reducing the amount of material being used in products and also looking at how it specifies its products to look at ways in which um, a, a product can be redesigned in a much lower carbon way than current alternatives. Then looking at downstream emissions, product design uh, can have a very big impact if a product is energy consuming. So looking at product design uh, choices that have an impact on the energy consumption um, and how a, a, pro a product is used during its lifetime. And also at its end of life, the extent to which a company um, can enable its products to be recycled and brought back into production use. So as you'll see, many of these things um, have a, uh, a close relationship with circular economy principles. And circular economy overall is a very important lever that a company can uh, put into place to decarbonize its products. With regards to um, product portfolio and offering, uh, a company, in addition to uh, specifying uh, the, the products and looking at product redesign, can also look at the range of products that it chooses to sell. And that can also lead to significant re reductions in carbon emissions. That, of course, requires close engagement and, and uh, collaboration with customers as well. More broadly, a company can also look at how its business model is designed and whether it can be uh, evolved over time uh, towards a business model that has a much lower carbon footprint. So, for example, looking at how it offers its products and services to the market, again, looking at circular principles, uh, looking at the extent to which its products can be remanufactured or redesigned uh, or offered in a way in which uh, the company can derive more revenue uh, with less uh, materials being used within its business model. <clears throat> and then two overall levers that have an impact on supply chain are engaging suppliers to decarbonize and also looking at how a company um, will source its suppliers, uh, looking to uh, engage with suppliers that have a, uh, a commitment similarly to decarbonize and that are willing to work with a company along its decarbonization journey. Supply chain engagement and working with suppliers is a very important area. So uh, in addition to those levers which a company can implement where it has more direct control on, so for example, uh, product design that we looked at earlier on, a company needs to work with its suppliers to also implement a range of measures that will enable the company to decarbonize its supply chain over time. The hardest thing about this aspect is that a company typically does not directly control its suppliers. It may influence them, and therefore it needs to collaborate with these companies and put together an overall uh, engagement plan and engagement program. The best practices for these programs to include three components. One is to look at improving measurement of, uh, of carbon emissions within the supply chain, so a company knows where it stands today and how the performance is improving over time. The second is to work with companies for themselves or suppliers for themselves to set targets. For example, 
um, enabling and working with suppliers for them for they for them to also set science based targets and finally to work with companies and suppliers to deliver on these targets and this can include uh, collaborating on innovation to reduce carbon emissions within suppliers operations, helping them also attract financing, for example, to invest in lower carbon production production methods. So establishing a supplier engagement program is a very important aspect that companies should look at uh, as part of its overall net zero decarbonization uh, roadmap and transition plan. All of this comes together um, as part of uh, an overall North Star, as we call it. And this brings together a set of targets and commitments into a uh, public commitment that all key stakeholders recognize and can get behind. And these can range from targets that um, are uh, relate to uh, carbon emissions. This can also include uh, a number of other commitments that a company will make. So, for example, uh, action on the levers that we've just looked at around scope one and two emissions and scope three emissions. And this will be an important reference uh, point for uh, companies and stakeholders within those companies to look at and to monitor over time and also to communicate externally to stakeholders. So that's companies and other uh, stakeholders and investors and partners um, can clearly see the components that underpin a company's net zero transition plan. Finally, a company should look at a set of catalysts that will enable the transition plan or net zero roadmap to be effectively implemented. It's very important for a company to, to define a set of actions and initiatives in the near term, which clearly show uh, its commitment and that it can start reporting progress against. Data is extremely important for companies to ensure uh, uh, are, is, is high quality and is fully understood both within the company and the supply chain. So where companies do not, do not have an effective uh, set of resources or infrastructure to measure and collect data on carbon emissions or other aspects that are part of their plan, it's very important for a company to put that into place. It'll be an essential enabler of progress and implementation of a transition plan, or if it isn't there, it can be a significant barrier. Thirdly, looking at governance and monitoring is very important for a company. So that includes setting a, a set of KPIs that management and uh, em employees across the company understand and know how to influence and act on. Uh, and also a set of governance processes whereby uh, uh, stakeholders within the company are effectively incentivized to deliver on the plan and also uh, potentially stakeholders outside of the company, for example, suppliers are also incentivized to reduce carbon emissions. And lastly, funding is extremely important. It is a key enabler to, uh, for transition plans to be delivered. So looking at options for green financing, whether it's uh, green or sustainability linked bonds and loans will be very important for a company to look at if it's not able to finance the change within its own from, from its own balance sheet. This will also be important for uh, implementing change within the supply chain and companies can also be a key enabler uh, for their suppliers to implement change if they're able to help them uh, attract investment and achieve their goals. I'd like to now go into an example of a transition plan of a company that we've worked closely with over a number of years to show how uh, these actions can be implemented and come together uh, as part of a, a company's strategy. The company here in question is Taylor Wimpy PLC. They're one of the biggest uh, housing developers in the UK. And they published this year uh, uh, a document called Our Pathway to Net Zero, which outlines the key steps that they uh, are taking to reach net zero and uh, set out uh, a clear strategy and pathway to decarbonize firstly through to 2035 and finally to reach net zero by 2045. Um, this has been a result of a, a long-term journey uh, from the company. They haven't started from a standing uh, start. They've been working on the climate uh, agenda for a number of years. And the Carbon Trust has helped them along this path as well. 
Most recently, we worked with Taylor Wimpy to set, uh, uh, to develop and set net zero targets for the company. And this developed the foundation uh, for uh, the company to develop a transition plan, which it has now communicated uh, to external stakeholders. And this plan also serves as a key reference point for the company to look at and to monitor and implement over the coming years. The company's transition plan looks at all aspects of carbon emissions and ways of reducing these across its value chain, both for scope one and two and scope three. So as can be seen on this diagram, uh, which illustrates the value chain for Taylor Wimpy, it looks at actions that the company is taking and will be taking within its supply chain, uh, within its operations, and also um, in the use of its products, which are effectively the homes that it builds uh, over their lifetime. And this includes working with the supply chain to reduce carbon emissions upstream, uh, both in terms of uh, procuring uh, renewable energy, looking at how raw materials are, 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 uh, are procured and sourced, and how to potentially look at lower carbon alternatives, looking at uh, logistics within the supply chain, also its own operations, and how uh, buildings and processes are run within, um, within, within building sites. And then finally, looking at also the uh, technology and design of the houses that it builds, looking at low carbon heating technologies, looking at also the design of its uh, of its of the housing to ensure that over their lifetime there are they are as low carbon as possible. And in fact, uh, the aim, key aim is for them to achieve um, the UK government's own ambitions to have zero carbon ready homes by 2025, which is just a couple of years away. So as this can be, uh, as this shows, this is a comp comprehensive uh, transition plan looking at all aspects of the company's value chain. And this translates into a decarbonization trajectory, which company, the company has published uh, as well. As you can see here, the starting point is um, the baseline of the company in 2019, and it has cl clear stages uh, all the way through to achieving a net zero target um, in 2045. The important aspect of Taylor Wimpy's net zero strategy is that is, it is a core part and goes hand in hand with the company's business strategy. It is not a separate strategy. It's a, it is something that the company uh, has committed to as a business and it is designing its business around the delivery of this objective, of its net zero objectives. So I hope this gives you uh, a sense of how uh, all these aspects of net zero planning come together. And I would like to um, make a few closing remarks. Remarks, Referring back to um, a framework which Hugh uh, talked about earlier in this presentation, we think that companies, in order to develop a robust transition plan, needs to need to put into place a number of actions uh, at, at key points. Um, in its journey. It's very important that a company has the right insight into its business, into the dynamics um, of its value chain with regards to carbon emissions and also uh, within the wider regulations and market to make the business case for action and to also inform the strategy that it will develop. A strategy needs to cover all aspects of a company's operations not just its own operations and value chain, but also more broadly, the business model that it has. And this will require companies to look at how the business model must evolve over time in order to make sure that it is fit for the future. And a strategy also needs to consider the wider systems impacts um, and also the influence that the wider system has on the company as well. And that wider system includes other players, competitors, regulators, technology, and so on. The strategy will then inform and drive uh, what needs to be implemented and the action required to uh, enable this transition to happen. So companies need to have clear plans, and we gave an example of the key elements of a net zero roadmap. Uh, these should correspond with the best practice defined by the transition planning uh, task force. 
Transition actions need to not just have a plan, but needs to need to also be acted on through uh, near term uh, initiatives and actions. A company needs to look at how it will get the financing to enable actions and enablers to be implemented. In many cases, these will require collaboration uh, across value chains, for example, collaboration with suppliers, but also collaboration in many cases with competitors. And a Carbon Trust has worked with many companies which have developed uh, collaboration programs across both suppliers and competitors and also customers in order to uh, create the conditions for effective decarbonization of wider systems in which companies operate. And finally, um, the actions and strategy need to deliver. They need to deliver the actual impact that a company is committing to. So a company needs to be clear about what it needs to disclose and what the expectations are for disclosure, whether it's from regulators, investors, or other stakeholders. A company needs to also report on its performance on a regular basis. So looking at and seeking assurance, which is, for example, verification uh, of its footprint on an annual basis or verification of the implementation of key actions is going to be very important. And finally, delivering impact will require um, broad engagement, engagement with customers, with suppliers, with competitors, with other partners uh, and regulators and government as well. So all these key factors which we work with companies on on a daily basis are extremely important. And I hope that uh, this presentation has given you some insights on what you as companies should be thinking of and what you can take as your next steps. Thank you very much. Hugh-san, Aren-san, arigatou gozaimashita. ネットゼルに向けたトランジションプランについて欧州の事例をもとに非常にわかりやすくご説明いただきました。それではこれよりご講演に関する Q&Aの どうぞよろしくお願いいたします。さて、本日講演してくれましたカーボントラストのヒュージョーンズとアレンスミスグレスピの2人にもオンラインに入ってもらっています。はい、ヒュー。はい、アレン。え、thank you the audience, please. Yes, uh, th thank you, Ken. Uh, my name is Hugh Jones, and I am the Managing Director of Carbon Trust Business Services, which is a team of 140 experts providing climate change advice and assurance to businesses all around the world. And we focus on strategy, risk, net zero, decarbonization, and also carbon labeling. はい、え、ま、翻訳するまでもないかもしれませんけど、ま、ヒュージョーンズですと。カーボントラストのマネージングディレクターで、ま、ビジネスサービスのチームを率いていますと。ま、チームは140人以上いるみたいですけども、え、
まあ、私があのこの分野で仕事を始めたのは、えー、2017年に、まあ、CDP で働くようになってからなんですがその頃はの CDP の,あのサプライチェーンのレポートライターをカーボントラスでやっていてこの時から、まあ、あの2人とはご縁があってですね、えーまあ、日本にはコロナ前は何度も来てくれてまして。それからの付き合いでもうですから7年ぐらいになりますけど、まあ、今回のテーマはその私がこの夏に久しぶりにロンドンに変わった時にヒュートであってですね今回のメービナのテーマについて相談したところ、まあ、TPT のこともあったからと思うんですけど、まあ、ぜひトランジションプランニングをやろうということで、まあ、今回になりました、まあ、今日のウェビナーで、えー、まあその内容を少しでも、えー、理解できたらと思ってますが。まあ、それでは早速ちょっと質問を投げかけてみたいと思います。えー、ちょっと、えー、個別のページに行きますけど、今回のその説明で、えー、の18ページなんですけど、えー、トランジションプランにはまあ6ヶ月ぐらいかかるという表が出ていました。でまあ、一方で、最後のテイラー・ウィンペイですかの例で見る限りは、まあ、多くの観点から顧客もですね、あの調査は必要だし、まあ、特にサプライチェーンやバリューチェーンのネットゼロについては、まあ、それを浸透させるのはなかなか時間のかかる仕事だと思うんですけど、まあ、一般に6回ずつってちょっと短いような見積もりかなと思ったんですが、あのー、実際どういう部分で、まあ、ど,どのぐらいの時間がかかっているのかをちょっと聞いてみたいと思います。えー、so is this、uh, the question to you?、Uh, yeah, please, please answer, answer to the, the question number one, please.、Yeah. Thank you, Ken.、Oh, yeah, Aren't Aren't yeah, sorry. Yeah.、Um, yes, thanks for the question, Ken.、Uh, so, Taylor Wimpy's transition plan was built on many years of work, which we have supported them on,、uh, which has included footprinting of their operations and value chain, and also setting science based targets. So, they were therefore able to use this experience to develop a first transition plan. However, developing a transition plan is a continuous process. So, companies that haven't done as much previous work can still put together a first disclosure and then continuously build on it. Normally, we would expect that、uh, developing a first plan should take approximately 12 months. Thank you, Aren. So, but,、uh, Taylor Wimby no Eco Kaku dewa, ma, carbon trust na support to stick tama, ok no tolikumi o sedeni, yatti ta to you koto de, so no i k a n t s e ma, a no, バリューチェーンのフットプリントとかですね、SBT なんかも設定してきたと、そういう中で、えー、仕事をしたところで、そのまあ移行計画に入ってきたんで、こういう長い付き合いからの,その情報の蓄積があってですね、それを生かして移行計画を開発してきたというところなので、えー、またその移行計画は作って終わりではないので、まあ、その4ヶ月とは言っても、その移行計画開発はまあ、連続的なプロセスなので、まあ、引き続きあのデータをアップデートしていっていくと、こういうプロセスだというふうに言ってますね。で、えーまあ、これまでのそういう蓄積がないような、あ,のあまり一緒に仕事をしてきてない企業、それから、まあ、あの開示をまず、まあ、それをやっていないようなところをですと、あのまあ、通常はですね、えー、12ヶ月ぐらいかかるというようなことを言ってました。OK。それでは次の質問いってみたいと思うんですけど、まあ TP えー、TPT の,その最終のフレームワークはこの10月に公表されたわけですけれども、まあ、プレゼンテーションの中で、えー、TPT は i h a s と、まあ、T、えー DCFD のフレームワークの上に成り立っているということが理解できたと思いますが、まあ、一方でその TCFD は来年から IFAS に統合されるというふうに理解しています。IFAS へのまあレポーティングと、まあ、TPT のレポーティングはまあ別々に掲載することになるんでしょうか、それともその移行計画については TPT に対応していけば、IFAS と、まあ、ISSB の方にも対応をすることになるのでしょうか、これを質問してみたいと思いますが。Okay,、uh, Aren, so question、yeah, number two, please.、That. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Ken.、Um, the TPT was developed under the sponsorship of the UK, the United Kingdom. However, it has been done in collaboration with other international organizations and initiatives.、Uh, the TPT is not mandatory、uh, at the moment, but it serves as a guidance for best practice. 
Now that the DPT has been published, we expect that other international and regional frameworks, such as the EU's CSRD and the ISSB, will use this as a reference when developing their own standards and requirements. So TPT is not yet part of the ISSB framework. However, as explained with the example of Taylor Wimpy, it is important that companies start developing their plans as early as possible. And the TPT is an excellent reference today for that guidance. Thank you, Aaron. <coughs> so, the TPT was on a での講演のもと開発されましたけれども、いろんな国際機関のイニシアティブとも協力して作られていますと。で、TPT はそのマンデタリー、強制的ではないのですけど、まあ、ベストプラクティスの指針として機能しています。で、TPT があの公開された現在になっては、まあ、EU の CSRD とか ISSB など、他の国際的なその地域的なフレームワークもですね、まあ、独自の基準と要件を開発する際には、もうこれをあの参考にしていくことがあまあ期待されているという,いうか、あの必然的にそうなるでしょうということで。でしたがって、TPT はまだその ISSB のフレームワークには組み込まれていないですけれども、あのテーラー・ウィンブリーの例でも説明したように、企業がそれをもとにです、ね、計画を開発する、まあ、重要性は大変高いと言えますと。まあ、TPT は今後、移行計画の開発の指針として使われる優れた基盤を形成していくでしょうと、こういうふうに言っています。Thank you.Next question ですね。えー、次の、えー、質問に行きたいと思いますけど、えー、っと、ネットゼロでは、まあ、最後の,そのリリジュアルをオフセットするのに、まあ、排除お、排出除去型っていうんですか、排除型のクレジット、まあ、CCS とかですね、DAC とか森林プログラムなんかで生成されたクレジットをオフセットに使用できると。まあ、現在一般的、えー、ただ一方で、その現在一般的にですね、えー、クレジットとして取引されている回避型、まあ、英語でアボイダンスとかミティゲーションっていうと思うんですけども、そういったのクレジットはですね、ネットゼロではカウントされないということで、えー、まあ、あの、SBT のところでも説明があったと思うんですが、で、えーまあ、日本でもその JPX でクレジットトレーディングが始まりましたし、まあ、世界各地でもクレジットの取引が置かれてますけれども、えーまあ、そういうこの2つのクレジットは一応分けては値段がついてるんですが、まあ、今後、クレジット市場をこういった中でどんなふうになると思うか、あちょっと聞いてみたいと思います。OK、is that a hit to you? Like a, yeah, question number three, please. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Ken. So, <clears throat> the Science Based Targets Initiative, or SBTI, that sets the standard for defining how companies should set their climate and net zero commitments. And the SBTI states that carbon credits related to carbon avoidance cannot be used to claim reductions in carbon emissions. Carbon removals can be part of meeting a net zero target to address residual emissions at the target year. However, availability of removal credit is currently very limited. Nevertheless, carbon avoidance credits do have a role to play in meeting companies' objectives for creating wider positive impact outside of their own reductions. The SBTI encourages companies to purchase credits as a complementary and parallel action to decarbonization, as well as investing in innovation and Uh, action that will deliver benefits outside of a company's value chain. So, to avoid the risk of greenwashing, it is important that companies invest in high quality credits from reputable providers and that they are very clear and transparent about impact claims. And this is also one of the TPT framework's requirements. そう、yes. あ今の,、まああの答えですけど、おまあ、サイエンスベースターゲットのイニシアティブでは、まあ、あの企業が気候及び、えー、ネットゼロのコミットメントをどのように設定するか、まあ、基準を定めていますと。で、SBTI によれば、その二酸化炭素の回避を関連する炭素クレジットは、炭素排出の、まあ、要はあの二酸化炭素の回避はそのいわゆる排出除去型
以外はまあ使用できませんということですね。排出除えー、と削除する除去の方のネットゼロの目標に達成する一環としては、まあ、リリジュラで削除することが採用できますと。で、まあ、ただし、えーとまあ、あの排出回避型のクレジットかというか除去型のクレジットについてはまだまだそのアベラビリティが低いというところで,で、えー、炭素回避のクレジットいわゆるアボイダンスミ,、えー、ミティゲーションの方はまあ、企業はよりあの広範囲なポジティブな影響を生み出すための目標を達成する際には役立っているので、まあ、SBTI としてはそのクレジットの購入をですね、えー炭素えー、脱炭素化の並行として行われる、まあ、補完的な行動としては奨励していますと。で、まあ、企業があのバリューチェーンの外でまあ利益を生む、まあ、ベネフィットになるようなですね革新的なその行動を投資することも奨励していますと。でまあ、大事なのはそのグリーンウォッシュにつながるようなです、ねえー、クレジットの使用になることで、まあ、そういう意味ではその信,頼のある信頼性のある、えー、供給元からの、まあ、高品質のクレジットをこうし,してまだまだあの除去型はそんなにそのマーケットに出回っているものではないので、まあ、そこの影響をその明確に確かめつつです、ねえーまあ、使っていく、まあ、これがあの TPT の,のフレームワークの要件でも一つ。の一つでもありますとこういう回答だったと思いますありがとうございますそれではえっと四問目に行きたいと思いますけどまあ最後になると思いますが、えー、まあ本日のプレゼンテーションでそのまあ移行計画について幅広くカバーしてもらったんですけれどもまあ今日のプレゼンテーションの中のでまあぜひですねまあ皆さんに持ち帰っていただきたいメッセージとしてえー、どんなものがありますかという感じで聞いてみたいと思いますが。はい、You and Aren, Ragasoya, could you answer to the question number four, please?Yes, of course. I'll go first. I've got three points, really.Firstly, the, the net zero transition is a journey, and companies need to regularly plan, execute, learn, and improve.Secondly, the, the, the core of a transition plan is defining how your company Will address climate related risks and opportunities and how you will decarbonize in order to meet your climate commitments. And then, thirdly, your customers, investors, and regulators will expect you to have a clear plan, but also to be able to finance it and to execute it and to show your progress along the way. Oh, <clears throat> ネットゼロはその移行はそういわゆるあのまあ業界でよく使うそのジャーニーだと言ってまして、まあ、その企業はまあ定期的にその計画を立て、実行して、えー、ラーンして、えー、まあ改善することを求められていますと。で移行計画の中心はあのー、まあ企業がです、ね、移行関連のリスクと機会についてどのように対処して、そしてその機構に関するコミットメントを達成するように、まあ、どうやってその脱炭素化していくか、それをまあディファインって言いますかね、あのまあ決めていく、定義していくことだと言っています。で、あの顧客とか投資家とかですね、それから規制当局、まあ、あのこういったところにその明確な計画を持って、えー、望んで、ですね特にその資金提供、その辺、まあ、この脱炭素のためのですね、えー、いろんなその資金計画、その辺をその実行して、えー、それをこう常に進捗を示していく、まあ、これ、2050年に向けての長いジャーニーですから、まあ、そこをあのしっかりとですね示していく、そういうことが企業に期待されているんだということが、まあ、送りたいメッセージだったと、こういうふうに言っていると思います。はい、okay, so Anything from Arendt, please? Yes, thanks, Ken.、Um, adding to what Hugh was saying,、um, transition planning is not just a periodic exercise for disclosure, it's a continuous business activity、uh, to drive change and ultimately to drive transformation.、Uh, also,、uh, another important point is that the transition to net zero is not easy. It will require innovation and collaboration with peers. Suppliers and even competitors. So that means that companies need to be clear and open about the challenges as well as the opportunities. However, 
Uh, we believe that companies that start the transformation process early will benefit from becoming more competitive and resilient as well. So, I think that's a good question. 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 単語で言うとドライブするっていうんですかね、えー、するようなあの連続的なビジネス活動ですとこういうことを伝えたいとで、まあ、ネットゼロへのその移行はあの簡単ではないですとで同業者やサプライヤーやさらには協業他社とのまあ革新と協力も必要なのでそのまあ単独でやるものでもないのかもしれないですねで、えー、企業の課題で、えー、これはその企業が課題だけでなくて、そのまあ機会についても明確にまあオープンな気持ちで、えー、望む必要があるということ。で、まあもう一点あの伝えたいのは、そのできるだけ早くこのジャーニーをですね、一行へのジャーニーを始めた方が、まあよりビジネスにおいての競争力も高まりますし、まあレジジアンスって言ってますかね、そのを高めるそういうメリットがあるので、まあ早くここに対応しましょうと。これがあのオーアレンからのメッセージでございます。はい。え、uh,、Thank you very much, both of you. You believe like a yeah, we are sending it's it's a that is message very well. So thanks ということで、いやあのこれでえっ、ー、と今日のウェビナーのまあ Q&A 締めたいと思いますけど、まあこういったメッセージでございます。今日はどうもあの。長い時間ありがとうございました。Thank you very much, Hugh and Alan. So, should I like say, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hugh さん、Alan さん、山口さん、ありがとうございました。また最後までご視聴いただきました皆様、ありがとうございました。本日の講演に関するご質問がございましたら、これからお送りしますアンケートにご記入いただけますと幸いです。後ほどご回答させていただきます。それではウェビナーを終了させていただきます。本日は誠にありがとうございました。